Gogo Berman Gang is pleased to welcome the genre bending Jilov, who, along with his band Special Sauce, forms a group that coined the term hip hop blues. Right? Mm -hmm. Good. All right. Yes, uh, sir. <laughs> with their most recent release album, Love Saves the Day, the band returns to the rock and roll roots. We'll talk a lot about kind of the, the, the new album. Uh, found it fascinating. I listened to it on a plane last night. Uh, Jilov's incredible career has spanned 20 years, over 20 years, produced 11 albums. Uh, with classic songs such as Baby's Got Sauce, uh, Rodeo Clowns with Jack Johnson, uh, Cold Beverage, uh, love the, 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 <laughs> the mug over there, uh, 50 Ways to, to Leave Your Lover, see, Cold Beverage. <laughs> All right. uh, this is hot. That's right. And, and this is your, so tonight will be your fourth or fifth uh, concert of, of this tour. Oh, yeah. So, um yeah, the fifth show. The fifth, yeah. fifth show. Sixth show. Sixth one. So, so going back three on the road. Tour. Going back on the road, three months. So, uh, and yeah, it's great to for you to take some time to, to come to, to Google Detroit to talk to us, to play for us. So, thank you. Uh, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Of course. <laughs> All right. So, let's go back. 20 plus years, 23 years, right? Yeah. So, something like that. Uh -huh. uh, uh, your sound is, is very cool, kind of unique. You are originally from Philly. Yeah. How, how did you start? Um, yeah, I was born and raised in um, Philadelphia. Um, my mother kind of got me involved in playing music at a young age, um, just probably how most parents do. Like I was drumming along the back of the you know, family uh, station wagon along with the radio and she said oh that sounds pretty good you want to play an instrument so I said oh yeah I want to play guitar and so um, soon after that I, I, I was uh, I was eight years old I found myself in folk guitar lessons learning kind of old-time Joan Baez type folk <laughs> songs or something and I, I, I was terrible at it and I hated it it hurt my fingers and my mother was already better at playing guitar than me so that was it was a struggle for the first five years or so um, and then when I was about 13 um, kind of figured out how to tune it and uh, started sounding okay and then when I was 15 I wrote my first tune and I think that was kind of uh, the age that you know a lot of you know kids kind of come into themselves when they're about 15 my son's 15 now and uh, yeah, once I wrote that first song, that was to me the real springboard, which would, you know, lead on into a career in music and you know being here today. So, thirteen things clicked. Fifteen, you wrote your your first song. You still remember it, right? Oh yeah. What what what? Which one was it? What was it about? Well, <laughs> it, I never did record it. Um, although I, I have recorded and released a lot of the tunes that I wrote actually when I was in, in high school. Um, the, the first tune, was a, it's a good example of, of kind of how I write songs. Um, you know, I, I always feel like um, a song can, can feel like one thing on the surface, but um, in reality there, there can be a lot of different circumstances that kind of lead to this thing happening, you know? And, and a lot of times also a song I feel should be kind of a knee-jerk reaction and, and therefore it's kind of real and poignant and true to life. So anyway, the first song was about two people. Um, you know, I had a little girlfriend and um, I think, uh, yeah, I was just really like, you know, I figured I was pretty much in love. I was 15, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was kind of about my love for her, but then also I think more importantly was about, um, my best friend, who actually is my manager now, um, he was going to leave school and go to boarding school. So you know, I was kind of bummed out. I was, I was, I was pretty sad he was, you know, going to be leaving the state and everything. So I had these emotions of being in love with this, with my little girlfriend, and then my best friend leaving home. So I wrote this song that seems like a love song on the outside, but I, th I feel like the emotion in it was, you know, kind of more written towards like you know, your friend, you know. So actually I've kind of continued to write, like I said, like that, um, 
one song can can have a lot of different uh, meanings, especially to me on the inside of it. Well, and, and, and with this one, kind of to take off of that, uh, uh, your songs are, are really interesting. Your videos are, are extremely interesting. It's, you can almost kind of like, you know, there's like a different story from the, the visual aspect than the, the song itself, both lyrically and musically. Uh, as I was kind of preparing for, for, for this, you know, I, I, and again, I, I took a couple quotes because people are describing your music in, uh -huh. in, in a very interesting, weird way. So groove heavy chicago blues infused brand of stripped down rock and roll <laughs> or it's uh, like i can't figure out what the hell that shit is. Exactly. <laughs> uh, uh, another one unique sloppy and laid back blues <laughs> sound that encompasses classic r and b okay. uh, right and like, yeah. like we we are in in, in detroit uh, you know I, I, clearly there's lots of motown influence uh, as well in, in some of those songs so how would you describe it <laughs> well, yeah, we, we've kind of always, um, we, we, we call it a hip-hop blues. Uh, I think that's the kind of, and it, it's funny because people say, hey, you know, I'll get in a cab. Oh, you play, what, what kind of music do you play? Oh, well, I play hip-hop blues. Oh, I love that kind of music. <laughs> well, well, really? Because we're the only people that do it. <laughs> you don't know who the hell I am, so. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's kind of what, it, what our music of G-Love and Special Sauce is anyhow. Uh, the kind of blueprint for it was um, I kind of learned a lot of Delta Blues, you know, people like Robert Johnson and um, Booker White, you know, Bob Dylan too and John Hammond. And um, and then also I, I grew up in the first, uh, I'm 44, so I look around the room, there's probably some people my age and, you know, probably the first generation of kids to kind of grow up with hip hop. Um, so. Like I said, I was learning folk music and then later blues music in my room, which is kind of a solo endeavor. But then when I'm out with my, with my, um, with my homies, you know, we're listening to hip hop and we're running around the city. And of course, in 1987 or whatever, there was a couple white rappers. There was the Beastie Boys, right? They were huge. And um, there was like third base and then Vanilla Ice, but everybody would rag on him, you know? <laughs> but uh, yeah, but the point is that you know, the the Beastie Boys seemed kind of a fluke, and and indeed hip hop was very, you know, uh, um, you know it was a it's a black music, it's a black art form from, you know, predominantly predominantly black neighborhoods. It's a true cultural music of America, like the same way that Delta Blues is, and I, I've always found. There's a lot of correlation there, but point of story is that you never thought like um, I never thought like I would be a rapper, and, and I don't know whether I am now, but I you know largely hip hop is a large part of our music, and um, and I do rap, so those two influences kind of collided for me um, in a really natural kind of way because um, you know. I was never planning on the two of them colliding, but but really my life was these were these two polar like kind of opposite things, like you know Peter Paul Mary and the Beastie Boys, you know, and uh, and I never thought about combining them, but eventually they just did because I was I became a street musician, and um, one night when I was out there playing, and this was like a great epiphany of my life, I started playing this blues riff. And then, I, and then I finished the song, and then I started rapping the lyrics for one of Eric B. and Rakim's songs called Paid in Full over top of it. And then I, at that moment, it was like, you know, it was like the, you know, the clouds parted, and I was like shining a light on the street in Philadelphia, and, and I was the only, you know, kid in the world at that moment playing a, a dobro acoustic guitar and rapping. And I was like, okay, well, now I got it. And that was what you want to have as a musician. You want mm -hmm. to find a, an original take on something. So, so and then I had to explain it. And that's the thing is that no one knows what it. No one could really ever put us in a box, right? It wasn't rock and roll. It wasn't hip hop. The, so the record labels, especially marketing people, right? They want to have an easy way to put you, but they never could figure out what what to call us or what section to put us. You could go into one. Tower Records, and we might be in hip hop, and then another one would be alternative rock. So, 
that's why we have a lot of adjectives and trying yeah. to figure out like, what, what we're doing. Well, and, and then yeah. even with, you know, early on, I mean, you, you got a decent rotation at MTV Network when pe yeah. people were watching it and when they actually played music. Uh, were you considered back then, like with MTV, hip hop? Or, or because again, your, your videos, especially the older ones, you know, the, I, I watch them on YouTube and, and they're very you know, black and white, very like soul and, and, and blues kind of videos. So I'm very curious about going from you know, the 15 year old who wrote the song to, to being a street musician, to finding your sound, then getting on MTV, figuring out, like when did you have to stop explaining and actually start playing and touring. What? Never. <laughs> uh, well, no, I mean, it, it's, it, it's kind of an interesting thing to talk about because, um, you know, like when we first, you know, came out with the first record, um, you know, everything changes in your life, right? You go from being a street performer, which we, everybody in, in, my, in my band, which is a trio, started as a street performer in Boston or Philadelphia. and. So you think about like you're really living on the fringe of society, right? So you're kind of f very far away from corporate America. You're very far away from making any money. You're a hundred light years away from, you know, the record labels, which are really just a couple hours down the road in New York City. Um, you're a million miles away from MTV and all the real music that you see every day on the, on that and. And holy shit, then all of a sudden you send your demo and then you have an opportunity to play and then they liked it and then now you're getting a record deal. And all of a sudden you went from, you know, not having a job um, except for playing a stream performer to now working for Sony Music and having a pocket full of money but working for like one of the biggest corporations not only in America but in the world, right? So, so like for us it was like overnight life changed you know, completely. And along with that, um, you know, then all of a sudden people want to know, well, you know, why are you here? What gives you the right to be here, right? Like, what's this music that you're playing all about? I don't know what this is. Explain it to us. And, and then, of course, for us, you know, being like the white kid from Philadelphia in the 80s, like, what gives you the right to play blues music and what gives you the right to play hip hop? Because clearly, you're not you know, built for that. So, um, and that was a real, like a really big thing in, in, in the, my early 20s was it, whether you're like defending your right to play this type of music or, you know, explaining why, why you came about doing it in the first place, it was never comfortable, you know. And then especially when you go over to Europe or you go to Japan, then they really hone in on, on this. And, um, and, um, so that was like a, 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 an interesting thing to kind of juggle, you know, mentally and um, emotionally. You know, what gives you the right to play this music? And then, of course, you meet the artists because we've toured with everybody from, you know, Buddy Guy who slapped my guitar here, no. to uh, <laughs> to like run, you know, Run DMC and everybody you can imagine, you know, Tribe Called Quest and. Gangstar, Dave, Dave Matthews Band, Dave Matthews Band, yeah. um, but I was really talking about like the hip hop yep. people because these people, these artists, they would never say like, you know, why are you doing this? Well, of course they knew right away. Like they could tell, you know, whatever we're doing, this is this is what they do, right? You do it because you have to do it, right? And uh, so the, uh, the artists were always very supportive, um, which was nice. You know, Q-Tip never said, yo, gee, you're white, why are you rapping? You know, he was like, yeah, man, I'm a fan, you know? And I was like, oh my God. Uh, so, yeah. So, uh, your early 20s. I don't know if I answered any question there. <laughs> no, but, but <laughs> you know, questions suck, okay. but the answers are great. It's, this is good. Uh, so, so, you know, early 20s, you, you kind of, you, you, you make it a little bit, you get on the TV, you tour a lot. Then you guys decide to, or choose to, or end up taking a fairly long break. Oh, uh, and then I mean, right now, because you mentioned right, right now, like you, in your forties, you, you're back with a new album, back on the road. Just kind of curious mentally, how are you approaching your touring times right now versus what you were doing in the past? Oh, I, I like to think that we finally figured out this whole thing now. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because there, there's, you know, definitely. Um, 
God, you know, the, the music business has changed and it's always changing, you know, uh, certainly because technology and, you know, things that you guys are involved in for, for sure. Um, and, um, you know, basically like, yeah, I, I got signed when I was 20, so I really didn't know, you know, anything about anything other than playing music. And, um, you know, it was a big learning curve. I definitely made a lot of mistakes along the way, trying to figure out how to navigate through the music business. And, and like I said, that's always changing. So how do I approach touring now differently? Um, you know, um, we have a saying that's called uh, back in the van again, right? Because you spend a lot of time when you're coming up, uh, riding around in a van and you like, you know, the 12 passenger vans that you rent from budget like the Ford 150 12 passenger white van. <laughs> you don't want to get back in the van again, right? So that's how you approach tour. Like we're not, we're, we're going to do whatever we have to do to not be back in the van, right? Meaning we want to, we got a tour bus. So traveling in a van is, is pretty tough. It's great if you're like 22 years old and don't, and you know, that's cool. But when you're like a, in your 40s, which, well, actually, I'm the only person in my band left in their 40s. Like, my drummer and bass player are now in their 50s. So um, we, we approach touring like a small business. So that's kind of what we've always been once we figured out, OK, aside from the music, this is a small business. Because we've, we never really had like a, even though we got signed and had that success, that, which seemed overnight, really that all that did was Basically, like you got a record deal that basically is like a small business loan, right? And then that set us on, on the way to, you know, keeping our business up. And our store is what we set up on stage every night, right? To sell like a pop-up shop, you know. So, I, I think we approach our, um, our touring like that, like um, on the business side. That's how we run it. It's pretty grassroots, you know. We have a small business. There's you know, two people in the front office in New York, and there's six of us on the road, including band and crew. And then we have like, you know, accountant and lawyer, and they're kind of independent, right? Um, but yeah, um, you got to look at the road as being, you know, a marathon, not a sprint. <laughs> and one thing that I, one thing that I have kind of realized along the way is that you're basically rolling around in circles, so. The world is so big, you, you can't get to it all, you know, every place you want to get to all every year. So it's, it's best to take your time. It's, it's a marathon. Yeah. Well, and, and so one thing I, I didn't know about you, which I thought was really interesting, the children's book that you wrote. So you know, the uh, Little Dad is a book for kids with traveling dads. I mean, clearly, you know, being for so long away from, from home, and, and having you said your kid right now is 15? Yeah. So, so, so uh, I mean, I, I have kids. Many of us have both kind of families, and, and we travel for different reasons. Right. It's very different. But I would love to just kind of hear from you, like what 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 got you to, to write the song? What was the experience, and did it impact you and your son, kind of the relationship that that you have had that you have right now? Um, yeah, you know, actually, I have a 15-year-old boy and I have a 10-month-old boy. So, wow, you know. Whoops. <laughs> but uh, no, but, but fatherhood has like, been the best thing, you know, for my life. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, you know, you never think it's going to happen, but then it does. And then it's like the greatest thing ever. So um, I'm not really great at planning things, but, uh, you know, uh, certainly being a dad's been the greatest gift of my life. and. Uh, and uh, yeah, so one thing is that, you know, if you guys travel a lot, like everybody travels these days, so it's, it never gets comfortable or easy to, you know, leave your kid at home. Really, no matter how old they are, like, you know, I, my, like I said, my older son's 15 now, and, um, you know, he's full on teenager, and every time I drop him off, I'm like, I, I gotta go. <laughs> See you in a couple weeks. You know, it, it never gets it never gets easy to say goodbye, and um, I think it's almost easier for the kids than it is for the parents because you feel like so much guilt and oh my god, I'm leaving, and 
so anyhow, I would, when my older son was a toddler, I would say, okay, well, where's daddy going to be? And then he would point at his heart, and then I'd say, okay, where's Aiden going to be? And he'd point at my heart. We'd say we always keep each other, you know, in, in each other's hearts. And, and that was the premise of this book, our, this, this book called Little Daddy is a book for kids with traveling dads. And um, so you, it's, on, it's, it's on Amazon. You can, they print it up there. But um, you can Google it. <laughs> and then find it. Um, but, uh, and, and then hopefully it'll sell enough copies so that I can write Little Mommies, you know, the book for kids with traveling moms, you know. One, yeah. one thing at a time. <laughs> but yeah, no, that's, but that's been good. But, um, you know, my older son, actually his, his stepdad is a musician as well. Um, so I couldn't quite figure out why his, his uh, mother went with him because she was so aggravated with what I did. And she, of course, went with another musician. But th we're great friends, and all of us. And, and um, you know, I don't know. It, it's, um, it is a juggle, though, like traveling so much. Because I, pr I probably do travel, like, you know, 250 days a year. Not, I don't do 250 shows, but I think that's about how much we're away from home. You know, I figured out, I think it's like every time I spend a night at home, it costs me like a thousand dollars. It's like a thousand dollar hotel room. You know, like that's how many, like if I'm home for, you know, if my mortgage is four thousand dollars, I'm home four nights a month. You know what I mean? It's like, damn, this is an expensive hotel, man. This place sucks, man. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, like, it's, yeah. Um, it, it's it, it it is something. It's it's tough to be away, and it, they they it, like they say you never get the time back, you know. And and that's something that I think that um, now that my son's 15, he's a sophomore. I can see him already walking out the door, and I'm just like, oh, you know, I have a lot of emotions. Like, man, you know, this is you never get that time back, you know. So it's it's a you know. I don't know what to say other than that. It's, it, that, that part of it is a tough it's, part of the job. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, have couple, I have a couple more questions. I want to make sure that we, we leave time for, for you guys, for, for Q&A. Uh, all right, before we go into the love saves the day, uh, uh, you, you did a couple commercials, Coke catalog. Yeah. Uh, you are on YouTube right now, you know, uh, having uh, actually like 1.2, 1 1.3 million views for some of your oh, kind of older songs. Good stuff. I, I know many of the artists, many of the musicians, they they, they look at social media. They, they they look at some of those things, Spotify, YouTube, being in the commercials as as as, as being something they, they they hate doing or they have to do, versus mm. others just embrace it. Now the whole idea of you as musician making money off of album sales uh, is, is I think it's kind of kind of gone in. The, Back in the history, so just kind of yeah. curious for yeah. you. And mm -hmm. I love the analogy, small business, yeah, pop up shop. Uh, how are you thinking of of digital, you know, YouTube, Spotify, social media? Right. What does it mean for you as as being a musician that's on the road, two hundred fifty days a year? Well, I think um, now, like in the past year or well, whatever, just very recently, they're finally starting to figure it out, and there's a lot more transparency in the digital music thing. So. Um, you know, that, that's one thing about my career. I've really seen, I, I, I got signed kind of five years before the very peak of the industry. So if you look at like, I think it was like 1999 or something when NSYNC put out a huge record and it was like the most records sold ever, you know, like way more than the Beatles ever sold, you know, in, in like a day or something. So that, that, if you look at that as like the peak of the commercialization of the success of the music industry. Then after that, you know, Napster came along, and then um, then there was 9/11, and it all hit the same time. And it, uh, and um, just to put it in perspective, like in October of 2000 and 2001, you know, like less than a month after 9/11, you know, I, I got a we got a call from our A and R guy, and um, you know. I, I was just happened to be in the office, and I said, "Oh, hey, Mike, how you, are you calling to drop us?" And he goes, and I was just joking, but I kind of knew it, you know. And he was like, "Actually, yeah, I'm calling it. Yeah, you know, it's been a great run, you know. Love you. This is the last time I ever talked to him." And um, and so, between 9/11 and Napster, the music industry really shit the bed. And then for the last, you know, 
you know, almost 20 years between that. Now it's been kind of trying to figure itself out. And now with Spotify and different streaming services, um, like I said, there's more transparency. And now the artists and the labels are starting to get paid from the streaming. And because the consumer likes the streaming, um, now they're not. Now you don't hear about people like pirating or stealing music, right? Because everyone gets it for free now, or with a small subscription fee, and that works out for everybody. So now you have a chance to make money off it, which is good because if the record labels can make money, then they can give budgets to people like us to make music because you know it does cost it, it does cost a certain amount of money to make a high quality record. I mean, you have to pay musicians, you have to pay for studio time and everything else. So um, I, I see now, we, now we see like good things starting to happen again. And um, so I, I feel better about the music business. Was it, you know, uh, the Cadillac? Cad Cadillac actually had a pretty heavy rotation. Cadillac. Of, of yeah. the commercial. Oh yeah, yeah. Did they, yeah. Kind of, did they use some of the song? Was, yeah. was it pretty cool? Like did, 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 did people text you like, hey, I just heard your song oh, yeah. in the commercial? Yeah, actually, so back to the commercials, like, yeah, the whole thing about commercials was that commercials, and if you're a musician, if you had a chance to do a commercial, it was really a sellout, a sellout move. That was the way, like, our generation perceived it, right? And to me, that, that ended when um, there was two major commercials, I don't know if you remember, but when, you know, the Beatles' revolution was in a Nike commercial, right? And then I think there was a Led Zeppelin song that was used in a commercial. And then Bob Dylan was physically in a Victor Victoria's Secret commercial. Which is, do you guys remember that at all? It was like the weirdest, like, it's like a Victoria commercial. Victoria's Secret commercial, and there's, all of a sudden there's Bob Dylan, like, sitting there. You're like, what, the, what is this? You're like, OK, man, well, uh, now it's all, it's all open season. Um, and yeah, certainly, like, the, um, you know, if you're me, you pray to God that, um, you know, some sometime during the year you're going to get that call where, oh, you know, Google wants to use um, your this song, an, an old song or a new song, or they want you to write a song or whatever it is. Yes, you know, we want to do it uh, because for us it's, um, you know, it's just like for, it's like money that you you don't expect, and on top of that, more importantly, um, you know, in this day and age, I feel like it's so hard to make a splash anywhere. There's so many outlets where people are getting everything from. You can't have, you can't achieve like maximum exposure. So every time you get a song played on anything, it's like a win. So to us now, it's like, um, whereas before it would be a real emotional struggle. Oh my God, well, you know, Coca-Cola wants to give us more money than we've ever made on anything. But now look, we could lose all our fan base. Like this is a real problem. Like we could take this money from Coca-Cola or Philip Morris. And, um, but God, if we do this, we're gonna upset our fans and the rock and roll gods. Like I remember, I, I really did have, like there was, um, and we passed a lot of stuff. We left a lot of money on the table for, the, for this reason. Like we left a huge Miller Lite commercial on the table. Like it was definitely like a three figure deal and it was probably like, well, no, that, that's a sellout, you know, we can't do that. Or like TGI Fridays wants to use your song, Baby's Got Sauce, in a rib commercial in the UK only. No, can't do that. Um, Philip Morris wants to use your song, Cold Beverage, in Eastern Europe only. And I said, well, tell them they can use it if they give me $1 million. Well, they never re replied, yeah. But basically, I was just basically saying, you know, fuck you, I'm not doing that, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, um, and now you think back, like, damn, I should have taken that. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so, uh, Love Saves, Saves the Day, your, your newest album. First of all, where do you record? In Philly, or do you, do you go somewhere else to record it? Uh, we recorded the latest record, and actually our last couple records in Brushfire Studios which is Jack Johnson's record label, record label and studio in um, Hollywood. Okay, cool. So, so uh, how is this one different from some of the other work? Well, uh, I mean, this, this record for us was kind of, um, you, you know, like records kind of flow and the music's always flowing and one thing leads to another. Um, 
So on our last previous record it was called Sugar, and um, I felt like we kind of stumbled upon the modern day version of the hip hop blues, which is very clear cut this time. It was like Cypress Hill style beats with Elmore James style guitar, right? And um, so I was like, okay, and that was the song actually they used in that Cadillac commercial called Come Up Man. Anyways, I felt like, okay, well now we got a really concrete blueprint and um, let's, we're gonna really push it on this record. So we really pushed, um, pushed that sound and, and then it ended up being rock and roll. Because basically if you push the blues enough, it ends up being rock and roll, right? That's how rock and roll was invented. So we finally, after 25 years, figured out how to play rock and roll. <laughs> uh, all right. Let's transition to, to some of the questions, Q and A's. So, so again, raise your hand, wait for a mic. Someone and, please uh, have a question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Laura, long, Hi, long, Laura. long time fan. Oh, thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, we were talking earlier actually today about a couple of our favorite live performers and how it is so different to see them in different cities and at different venues. and how they can kind of like vibe off of the city or even the venue itself. So outside of your roots in Philly, because it wouldn't be fair to include that, do you have a favorite venue or a favorite city to perform in? And you don't have to say Detroit either. <laughs> That's right. The MGM Grand tonight. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, it's a good question. Um, uh, I mean, really, short answer is no, because I really do like to um, every night you're in a you're in a chance, and like you said, you, you have a, a room full of people. It's a different room, different crowd. You have a chance to vibe with them and uh, connect with them and make something happen, like with your guitar and the microphone. So, um, and to me, like a great experience can happen at a like a really prestigious club, like the Fillmore in San Francisco, or it can happen at the you know corner bar, you know. And it often does. And, and, and honestly, sometimes a lot of the bigger famous rooms, um, like Red Rocks, for instance, you know, like if you're going to say like, if you're going to say like, what are the best yeah. venues? Well, then you have to say like Red Rocks or the Gorge in Washington, which is on the banks of the Columbia River Canyon. And like the sun goes down and then the moon rises behind the stage. And it's, it's really a beautiful place to see or play. And, um, but like Red Rocks is one of these rooms where I feel like every time I've had that opportunity to headline it twice, and I feel like it's really kicked my ass every time. Like it's, it's like, you know, you're backstage and you're walking around, you're looking at all the pictures of people who played there. Like, you know, you grew up, like there's a Beatles played there and you know that you two did the Sunday Bloody Sunday video there. And you're like, now I gotta go out there. You know? I saw you at Red Rocks. Oh, you did? Yeah. Well, hopefully you had a better time than I did. <laughs> I did. Definitely. Oh, good, good. Well, yeah. So, yeah, so it can happen anywhere, but I just like to, I like the experience, yeah. Hi, thanks for coming in today. Um, like Laura, I'm a longtime fan. I think the first time I saw you was 10 years ago with Donovan Frankenritter and uh, Jack Johnson. So you've uh, described yourself as hip hop blues. So how did you meet up with Jack Johnson and Brushfire Fairy Tales? Because that's very not hip hop in a, in a sense. So it's oh, kind sure. of a, it's a good blend of the two. So how did you kind of meet up with those guys? Um, well, that's a, that's a good story too. Um, Jack, uh, Jack was, okay, a buddy of mine from Avalon, New Jersey, because I, I grew up in Philadelphia in the city, but then in the summer times, you know, my family would stay at the Jersey Shore, and uh, so I grew up surfing, and so I had a lot of, you know, all my, we had a little surf town in New Jersey. One of these guys that I was, had grown up with, um, he ended up being a surf photographer and met up with these Jack Johnson and the Malloy brothers, and they were making these surf films. And um, they were stealing my music, so they had what they had, you know, put about seven of my, of our tunes into one of their a couple of their movies and not cleared it, you know. So like a surfing buddy was like, "Hey man, yo, gee man, this kid I looked up to my whole life, you know, because I was never very good at surfing." 
And uh, so the cool kids was like, yo, you, yo, Garrett, come over. You got to come over to my house right now. Oh, my God. And then he's like, look, your music's in this movie. I was like, damn, they stole that shit. <laughs> So then we like got in touch with them, and then so the first um, interaction with Jack and his surfing buddies was like, "Yo, you stole our music," and then they said, "Okay, well here's some surf wax and surf leashes and track top." Like, okay, thanks. But but then um, <laughs> I did have the opportunity to meet Jack. Um, so he he had he was just a kid, and um, he had a guitar, and we went for a surf, and then we traded songs and. And he kept singing all of his tunes. And I was, one part of me was like, this guy's a cool kid. And one part of me was like, this guy's a fucking rock star. <laughs> and like the songs were like, it was, he basically played me that whole first record, Brushfire Fairy Tales. And um, yeah, so I think long story short, he was a big fan from when he grew up. But um, uh, it's been great because our music's really rubbed off on one another. A lot. And actually, if you do listen to Jack's flow, like he, he actually really is like a rapper. Like he's actually, even though he's not a rapper, like he, he's flowing as if, and he's a real lyricist. So yeah, it's been a great relationship. All right, thanks for coming in. Any uh, favorite memories or f funny stories from traveling or being on the road all those years? Um, yeah, a couple. <laughs> I'm trying to think if there's a good one in, in Detroit. Um, oh, I don't know. You want to hear a dirty story? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Um, well, I don't know. There's one fun. I don't know. I probably should. I don't want to tell a dirty story. I always do. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Okay, after. Um, I know that's like a tough question, like tell a funny story from the road. But, um, oh, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I'll, let me come back to that because I got to think of a, one that's not too dirty and appropriate <laughs> for the internet. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you think of it, we'll probably have time for one, maybe two more questions before we, we do a performance. So, again, raise your hand. How's it going? Yeah, uh, so you mentioned, uh, you know, obviously you're very influenced by the blues, and you specifically called out Buddy Guy as somebody that you'd opened for before. I was wondering if there was like ever a group you were opening for that you were a big fan of, or like kind of starstruck going in and kind of talking with them, and kind of how that played out. Yeah, th that's that's a lot of people. Like, um, well, actually, well, actually, here's here's a funny story, and it'll go with the last one too. But this is kind of a funny one because um, it kind of encompasses both things. But back in the day, there was this festival, the Horde Tour, right? And this is, a, this is cool because, um, and Blues Traveler, who actually I toured with last summer, this was their thing, and they were running it. And this was amazing because I, three years before, I had jumped over the fence when I was 16 and snuck into the Blues Traveler, opening up for the Allman Brothers show in Philadelphia. And now I was like, you know, backstage at catering and there's John Popper and all these people and all these musicians and this one guy comes up to me and goes, hey man, are you G-Love? And I was kind of pretty shy when I was, well, not shy, but I was, you know, when I was 20, I was a different guy. But um, I was kind of keeping to myself, um, hey, hey, are you G-Love? Oh yeah, I am, how you doing? Oh man, I'm a, I really love your record, really big fan. Oh, thank you so much. Um, and I'm like, well, so you know, well, so what do you do? Oh, are you are, are you a musician? Oh, yeah, oh yeah, I'm a musician. Um, well, um, well, what's your name? Oh, I'm Dave. Nice to meet you. Well, what's your what? Well, what what what's the name of your band? Oh, Dave Matthews Band. <laughs> I was like, all right, man. Well, great to meet you, man. Well, good luck. Good luck out there. <laughs> I had no idea who he was. He was like. Yeah, I'm Dave Matthews. What's your band? <laughs> oh, Dave Matthews band. But then, and then, and so now, like, I've, so then, of course, Dave Matthews from that summer, which was 95, that was probably when he was just starting to break, but, like, I was just listening to the blues. I had no idea what this, who this guy was. And it took me years to understand that kind of what they do and why it's successful and why people love it, and I love it. 
But now I have, a, I have like a running thing, like stupid things that I say to Dave Matthews. Because like every time I see Dave, he's like the nicest guy, but like every time I, I say the stupidest shit to him, every time. Because whenever you open for him, he'll come backstage and like he, he, he's one of the few guys when you're opening for him, whoever's opening for him, he, he meets you backstage and then he introduces you to the, like the five people that aren't in the parking lot and they're actually gonna watch you play out of the 50,000 that are gonna be there. But um, I think the last time I said to Dave, I was like, um, they had, we was at the Gorge and this, they, they had this bluegrass guy sitting in with them and he sang this great song called By the Side of the Road. And I, I was like, oh, this is the greatest song ever, By the Side of the Road. So then Dave comes the second day Dave's there, and his voice is hurting. And I go, Dave, man, I got a great show last night. I got a new favorite song. And he's like, oh, which, which one? I was like, by the side of the road. It's not even his song. It's the other guy's song. <laughs> I'm like, fuck. <laughs> anyway, yeah, but long story short, yeah, like I get starstruck. I get starstruck a lot, and um, that's probably like why, like I'm, I'm like a fan first, which is why I like get people to sign my guitar, but um, the funny, the, the most recent funny one was like we toured with Cypress Hill two summers ago and my guitar tech is named Big Scrimp, right? And he's this big fat bald guy and he looks real mean and tough, but you know, he's one of these guys like a teddy bear once you know him. But him and I are like really big fans of Cypress Hill. So we're like, we're like two little schoolgirls in catering. We're like, there's Be Real. <laughs> there's Sun Dog. Like, Hey, hey, be <laughs> like we just have all these jokes. Like, yeah, we get get totally starstruck. It's pretty pretty funny. So you guys are ready for some music? Yeah. Yes. All right. Oh man. All right. It's on by I ninety five and everything that happens on it. One time I was driving from New York City back up to Boston and I wrote it down and it goes like this. I'm going back to Boston, I think I'm losing my mind I'm going back to Boston, driving on 95 Well, I know your girl, she ain't no friend of mine Boston cold man, see them women wearing too much clothes Yeah, them Boston girl, they don't like to stay at home Oh, when that sun is shining, they got a lot of ladies show Baby. Whoa, I'm a good man, so I need a good woman too. I'm a real good man, oh, I need a good woman too. Well, that girl I love, don't do nothing but give her the blues. Whoa, we was to be married, married in the spring. Whoa, Mary, I give her my diamond ring. Oh, now she changed her mind She doing her own thing Now do your thing, baby, like this now I like it when you do your thing, though I just wish you do your thing with me One of these old times Come on back home, baby I treat you right Now let's go get a feather And all these Boston girls, they got to stay all covered up. But when it's summertime, they sure look good enough. But not as good as those girls from Detroit. But. Whoa, I'm looking for a woman that's looking for a worry man. Oh, now I'm looking for a woman that's looking for a worry man. Oh, that New York girl, she don't never try to understand me though. So I'm going back to Boston, I think I'm losing my mind. 
Yeah, back to Boston, drive behind 95. I thought I'd find looking woman. Oh, she gon' help me ease my mind. Ease me, baby. next song called Bad Girl Baby Blues. Time record, baby. Or just give me half a change to get you dancing around my room with nothing but your underpants. Light some candles. Ooh, we gonna burn one down tonight. We've been black out and bruised, bloodshot and blue. Down, wrong up, strung out, misused and confused. We had our bouts and our doubts. Oh, I'm still crazy over you. It's hard to say all the reason that I love you, baby, when you're pushing me out the door. Don't you do I once had a heart, oh, I gave it away, and I was yours, honey, so treat it good. Some pawn shop glasses with a little paint on the wall. Ooh, just look at me deeply, baby. I'm the man that knows just who you are. You're the one I choose. I refuse to lose my bad girl, baby. I had to play this song today because it's inauguration day. <laughs> Look forward to writing a lot of great songs in the next four years. <laughs> it's been hard on us artists to write the last eight. <laughs> I gotta use my superpowers Even though saving the world out of style It ain't my fault all this bad stuff is happening But now it's time I put my foot on down Oh baby, my love don't seem the same Oh no it don't Man, they say that love 
is all you need to hear the world Plus a trillion billion dollars, have you heard? That President Trump, Santa Claus, and Green Goblin Saddam Hussein, Spider-Man, and Bin Laden Britney Spears, Jesus, and the cast of the friends Met for brunch last week to solve the world problem But it caught on me Oh, baby My love don't say the same Man, if they caught on my name, don't you know I do it? Shot my signal over Detroit, I've been true. It is my distinct pleasure to come down from my grass. Get off of my front porch and save all your asses. And in the nick of time, too. Oh, baby, my love don't seem the same. Changes come over me, my muscle growing, so I freestyle my ass across the USA. Stop the economy, change the environment, save the environment, change what you're doing, yeah, man. Oh, baby. Man, if you can't do smack, but you better do something. This is the time when you so sure can't do nothing. That means you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and me too. Oh, baby. Fly overseas and set all the slaves free from prostitution, sweatshop, child labor, stop the myriad of problems in the Middle East. Making some power point. We have to fight for all your fears and I take all the truth back from wherever they roam and whatever they're fighting and whatever side they're on. Send them on the first plane home to their moms so we can make coffee tables out of all these bombs. And save the whales and the me mama says too. But it really ain't nothing All you gotta do is get bit by a spider or something We could change the world in a week or a day And if you got problems, well I sweep them away So you find yourself in a world full of trouble Just call on G-Love, the superhero brother And I'll be there Yeah, I'll be there Oh, I'll be there You know it, I'll be there Oh, baby Do one more. Yeah. Special request Woo. for the lovely ladies in the front here. <laughs> uh, thank you guys so much for having me out today. And uh, <laughs> and we'll be at the MGM Grand tonight if you want to come get lucky <laughs> at the casino. <laughs> Although I did realize I, I, it's a it's a tough pill to swallow, but it, it, the easiest way I can make money is playing the, the guitar because. I'm a lousy gambler. <laughs> As I found out again, now we're starting to play more casinos, so um, it's always tough not to take your gig money and go put it on black. <laughs> All right, now, now this song, um, Baby's Got Sauce, and um, so this, this was one of my um, original tunes, right? And um, this this was I I had this the version I'm gonna play for you is the original version before I met my band um, and my drummer put it put it on the words on a different groove and that became the song that you guys know but this is the original version all right so you can't be like oh man G fucked the song man he changed it up this is how <laughs> this is how it goes all right this is the, this is originally how it goes okay so it goes like this all right. It's the same thing, it just goes a lot faster, you know what I mean? If you don't like it, that's good, it'll be going quicker. <laughs> cooling out, cooling out. 
Standing out waiting for my lady Got a special sauce She's my baby, my baby, my baby And of course I'll do anything for you Anything she want So on and got a sharp mouth for short song Give me, give me some Don't take that out, give me, give me none Got to work and deserve it Earn it to own it The one she got So never ever wanna leave it Alone don't take my spring and book it And never been stood up Yo, she does the stepping You know my baby got sauce You know my baby got sauce Your baby ain't sweet like mine Whoa, she ain't sweet like mine She got sauce Your baby ain't sweet like mine She got sauce Ooh, yeah, she got sauce Yeah, she do She's so sweet too She got that sauce Oh, honey You know you got it, baby Well, that's some funky lemonade you got going, babe Is it special for me? Did you make it today? I'll always stop by if you like me to I'll do anything that you want me to do A kiss for some of this Smiling is done Miss, I'm your mister My sister's your sister Mother's your mother Father's your father It all started when I kissed her It was love at first sight Better when it started I ain't broke your heart up, but babe Some time alone with the crew Do the stupid thing that we used to do Up on there, she slammed me with the frying pan Ain't it love? I can't leave it, man, she got sauce You know my baby got sauce You know my baby got sauce Your baby ain't sweet like mine She ain't sweet like mine, she got sauce Your baby ain't sweet like mine, she got sauce Oh, she got that sauce Yeah, she do That's so sweet, too Baby. Now. My baby got sauce And of course It's a matter of course She does what she wants to Cause yo she's the boss Please don't tell my friends About a situation They think I'm on Some extended vacation Don't get out And see my boys anymore The only time I leave my house Go to the store For some of the What you, what you, what you want me for What could she want this time I'm all hers She ain't even hardly mine Oh baby And believe me What she do at night I don't know I know that something ain't right, cause she got me waiting. She comes and waiting. I try not to raise my voice, negotiating. Yo, she went to argument. Should've started it. I'm broken hearted, but you know I can't be bored. I cause my baby needs a taste. I count my loss. Woo, she got that sauce. Oh, yeah. You know my baby got sauce. Your baby ain't sweet like mine. Oh, she ain't sweet like mine. She got sauce. Baby ain't sweet like mine. She got sauce. Yeah, she got sauce. Oh, she do. She's so sweet too. She got that sauce.